Good evening, good evening. Good evening. Hi. We are live, Four, sir. Three, one. We are live now. Good evening, friends. Greeting from Uttarakhand. Today is our seventh webinar of state arthrodesis, and we are having eminent faculty of spine surgery all over the India. And today, Dr. Naveen Agrawal from Uttarachal, he will moderate the session. Over to you, Dr. Naveen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, with the permission of uh, Jaiswal, sir, as he is the chairperson for the today's session, I'd like to start the session. Sir, can we start? Go ahead, session? Naveen. All yours. Take, yeah. So take our first speaker yeah. is Dr. Abhishek Srivastava. He is a senior consultant spine surgeon in Max Super Specialty Hospital, Delhi, and he'll be giving his talk on uh, lumbar PIBD. Sir, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity, and I would also like to have permission of chairperson to go ahead with my talk. Go on, all the best. Okay, thank you. So. Let me pull up my talk. Look, looking forward to a great talk, Abhishek. Okay, sir. Thank you. And now... So... Today I'm going to talk about some basics of lumbar disc herniation. As an orthopedic surgeon and, uh, you know, taking care of uh, back pain is a routine thing along with leg pain. And lumbar disc herniation is one of the most frequent problems which uh, any orthopedic surgeon or a spine surgeon will come across in his or her daily practice. So I'm Dr. Abhishek. I work as a senior consultant spine surgeon at Max Hospital, uh, Vishali and Panshil Park. So I'll be talking about this today. So... Uh, as we all know that it is a degenerative process which leads to lumbar disc herniation. Uh, the intervertebral disc is composed of two components. One is nucleus pulposus, which is a gooey substance inside. And annulus fibrosus is the one which contains this gooey substance and uh, provides some rigidity. However, with aging, there is loss in ability of the nucleus to imbibe water. And uh, the uneven stresses on the annulus cause focal extrusion of the nucleus so this is the portion which can come out and you know go in the spinal canal or irritate the nerve around the spinal canal so this is the main problem which is causing the symptoms in this situation so as we have all heard this is the classical cascade of crickle day villis it's a part of three uh, joint degeneration usually happens in third to fifth decades. But however, due to changes in lifestyle, now we are seeing this problem even in teenage adults, uh, teenage uh, teenagers as well, as well as young adults. So this has shifted, but classically it presents in third to fifth decade. So it can be combination of factors which lead to synovitis, leading to hypermobility, dysfunction in the disc. It can lead to tears and later herniation. There can also be capsular laxity which can cause instability and uh, lead to nerve entrapment, subluxation and all the other things. It can be single level, it can be multi-level as well. So these are the disc problems which you can see. As you can see, this is a normal disc where the height is restored. Uh, there is complete continuity of the annulus and there is no bulging. Where here you can see there are some cracks in the annulus. This is an early degenerative disc. However, it has not poked inside the uh, spinal canal. This is a bulging disc. As you can see, there is a contained, there is nothing, no annulus, no uh, nucleus is out into the canal. However, it is pushing on the annulus, which is pressing on the contents of the spinal canal. This is a frank herniated disc. As you can see, the nucleus has tore through, you know, broken its way through the annulus and is now uh, pushing on the uh, spinal canal and nerves also. This is also a thin disc and this is just a degeneration where you can see osteophytes and an attempt to stabilize the spine. So this is what in nutshell is uh, you know, the way disc herniation happens. 
Now, as I have already told you, there are various types of herniations. One is protrusion, where the annulus is just uh, touching the spinal nerve, nerves in the spinal canal because the uh, the deficiency in the annulus and the nucleus is pushing from inside. Whereas extrusion, there is break in the annulus and the disc material, which is the usually the nucleus, has come out and is pressing on the nerves. Whereas in sequestration, the fragment which has protruded is detached from the main mother fragment, mother uh, segment and is lying free in the canal. So these are the things which we should be able to identify on our further review. This is the, you know, uh, just an anatomy key, anatomical uh, representation of the spinal canal. This is the central portion. This is called as posterior lateral portion where, you know, uh, towards the medial border of the pedicle and this region is the foraminal region and anything outside the pedicle's purview is extra foraminal or far lateral region. As you can see here, there is a posterior lateral herniation and it is pressing on the L5 nerve root. Here an extra foraminal herniation is there which is pressing on the L4 nerve root. So we have to be careful about, you know, how to read the spinal canal whether and be able to decide where what is the location of this uh, disc prolapse is it central is it posterior lateral is it foraminal or is it extra foraminal because that has implications in the management so when do you suspect a disc prolapse when you see a young or middle-aged person usually with a history of lifting of heavy objects and he has got a sudden catch in the back and starts having radiating pain going down into the legs which is commonly called as sciaticum this Leg pain increases on activity, coughing and sneezing and in some severe cases, it may be unrelenting and not relieved by any means, whether lying on side, lying flat, you know, sitting or anything. What worries us is when it is associated with weakness of toe and foot muscles yeah, and the patient is unable to stand on tiptoes, which is a manifestation of weakness of the foot or toe muscles. So that's a rapid test which you can do when you are in OPD to see if there is any weakness in the muscle, numbness on the outer side of the leg. You always have to ask for numbness in the foot as well as perineum because perineum uh, is something which gets numb when there is a cordyquina syndrome. Also, the patient is usually stoop forward. Stoop forward is a protective and a list. So these two are protective posture in which the dimension of the spinal canal increases and the space which is occupied by the disc herniation, the canal, the, the posture tries to relieve that compression on the nerve. So, list can be ipsilateral and contralateral depending on where it is located and uh, that can help in diagnosis also. So, these are the main nerves which are usually affected. L4, which you can check by checking the contraction of uh, tibialis anterior and uh, see knee jerk and sensation on the medial malleolus whereas l5 nerve root you check it by ehl and uh, you know there is no reflex however sensation is on the front of the dorsum of the foot s1 is usually checked by peroneus or you can do a you can ask the person to push against your hand as in you know uh, putting a pedal so these are the main dermatomes which I have just described. Now coming to diagnosis, you should always start by doing a AP and lateral radiograph which can show you degenerated disc. You can also make out a transitional vertebra which is very important in avoiding wrong level. You need to do a flexion extension view if possible to rule out any instability or spondylolisthesis and uh, any lysis in the uh, pars area. Then the gold standard test in today's uh, day and age is magnetic resonance imaging, which is MRI. And thankfully, now it is easily available at all the places. And we should get a MRI scan of the area which we think is affected. Usually it is the lumbar spine and always do a screening whole spine so that you know and you rule out other pathologies. So MRI helps us to uh, delineate the disc pathology. It can help us localize herniation whether there are fragments or not, is there any root anatomical variation, foraminal pathology, what is the site of fecal compression in the spinal canal and it helps us exclude other conditions as well. Sometimes there can be infection which is mimicking a prolapse intervertebral disc, there may be a synovial cyst, there may be perineural cyst, there may be a neurofibroma and many other diagnoses. 
so exclusion is equally important as well as diagnosis so this is a 28 year old female left radicular pain slr was 45 degree left side ankle jerk was absent this looks like a disc herniation however when a contrast enhanced scan was done it was enhancing and it turned out to be a nerve shoot tumor so you always have to keep your eyes and ear open and be able to entertain alternative diagnosis whenever in doubt you should ask for a contrast scan as well especially when there is a large herniation so what is the management of this problem so the most uh, common management which we follow and which we advise everyone is the conservative management you should not jump to surgery straight away and conservative management should be there in your mind always and it is the mainstay of treatment and thankfully most of the people will recover with it and majority of patients will need that for about four to six weeks only so uh, and conservative management has to be done when there is no weakness in the legs you know there is no bowel and bladder symptoms are there and Conservative management is the first line of treatment as it is very rewarding because 80% of people improve after 6 weeks, 90% after 12 weeks and 93% after 24 weeks. So the natural history is very favorable. Even the herniations which are there, they diminish in size over time with about 80% decreasing by 50%. However, the MRI will continue to show the annular bulge and herniation in uh, some cases. Uh, especially in cases where the disc is herniated and there is a free fragment lying in the canal sometimes it can just uh, you know be eaten up by the uh, mechanisms of the body and you may not see that herniation later which may be quite dramatic at the onset and will uh, disappear so there are some cases which i have seen in my practice that resolve better if the fragment is herniated and is uh, sequestered into the canal so surgery, when we talk of surgery, when do we do the surgery? It is an absolute indication when there is Corda Equina syndrome. Corda Equina syndrome is defined as painless overflow incontin incontinence. So that is called as complete Corda Equina where there is weakness in the legs, perineal numbness and bowel bladder involvement. Uh, there we don't have to wait and we have to operate within 48 hours. Uh, next is progressive neurological deficit. If the weakness is, improve, is not improving and it is deteriorating the patient is not responding to conservative treatment of four to six weeks and the patient gets better and then gets recurrent attack which is affecting activities of daily living so one in, uh, indication is called equina where there is absolute the patient comes to the hospital gets the surgery done and doesn't go and go back goes back home whereas in other indications there whereas in other indications you know it is more of a lifestyle uh, choice where you know you want to uh get a better life you know out of uh, this problem so that is why you get the surgery done so what is conservative management conservative management will entail usually rest which is not exceeding more than two to three days however rest doesn't mean complete bed rest patient can get up go to bathroom and toilet also can sit up and have you know dinner and lunch and uh, rest the rest of the time there are medications which can take care of the pain the brace i mean i tend to prefer only in acute phases and physiotherapy sometimes it can help you can do short wave tens interferential and once the pain settles down i encourage patients to go for graded exercises uh, so what are the medications NSAID alone can be given and say plus muscle relaxant however for short duration if the pain is very severe narcotics can be added anti-epileptics such as gabapentin pregabalin uh, oxcarbamazepine and duloxetine are helpful in neurogenic pain oral steroids i usually do not recommend in my practice it is better to give a nerve root block rather than giving an oral steroid because it has got its own set of problems antidepressants can also help in some patients with chronic back pain and epidural steroid as i said is controversial especially the interlaminar however nerve root block the recent evidence has piled up which tells us that it can be a good management of choice in conservative care so interlaminar approach i tell all the patient that it is like carpet bombing where you cannot control which nerve is there it doesn't have diagnostic value a lot 
it is mainly for therapeutic and it can help in lot of patients uh, however there is no sustained benefit in terms of pain relief function and avoidance of surgery as shown in various you know studies however transforaminal uh, approach you target the nerve and you give around the area where the drug is required the drug goes into the area where it is uh, needed and it may decrease the need for surgery also there are favorable responses to it in about more than 70% cases recent study by rishi and raj sekran have shown that if nerve road block is done properly it can provide good resolution of symptoms in more than 70% of patients uh, and the effect is sustained in their follow up of over one year so transforaminal is uh, or selective nerve root block is a very good modality if the patient is not responding to conservative management and is not willing to go for surgery also you want to do a diagnostic intervention and try a therapeutic trial conservatively before going ahead with the surgical procedure so as you can see here uh, in this study uh, evaluated for 2 3 days 7 days 15 days bed rest and activity for patients with sciatica there was no difference between rest in bed and to stay active acute low back pain also advised to rest in bed is less effective than advised to stay active this i have already highlighted in the conservative care so there are other things which are very popular uh, especially in the northern region for management of lumbar disc herniation traction being one of them however the evidence is against traction and there is no benefit especially in lumbar diseases that traction improves the outcome or uh, hastens the natural history of resolution uh, also coming to bracing limited evidence is there in fa which favors lumbar support compared with no other treatment so what are the indications for surgery as i have already detailed before i will come back to it again so that it gets ingrained in you a uh, leg pain extending below the knee that has persisted for at least 3 weeks despite the conservative treatment for minimum of 3 to 6 weeks Cordae Quinas syndrome, as I have already discussed, is an absolute indication for surgery, and it is one of the urgent indications for surgery. And the relative is recurrent incapacitating episodes of sciatic pain. So, what is Cordae Quinas syndrome? Large central disc herniation below L2, compression of all nerve roots. It causes bowel bladder dysfunction, saddle anesthesia, variable loss of sensory and motor functions, and timely surgical decompression is of paramount importance. preferably within 24 hours and not later than 48 hours also increasingly now we are recognizing that corda equina syndrome complete as well as incomplete corda equina syndrome the prognosis is very good in incomplete corda equina syndrome where there is fleeting perianal numbness or some early bladder disturbances or weakness in the legs but it is still the bladder is able to function somewhat and it is not a painless overflow incontinence painless overflow incontinent uh, incontinence is called as corda equina complete syndrome and the prognosis is poor however still the chance should be given and decompression should be done within 24 to 48 hours so now the distinction is between corda equina syndrome complete and incomplete and we should be more aggressive in treating incomplete corda equina syndrome because corda equina syndrome complete are a result of very severe injury to the nerves because of the disc herniation and what is the timing as i have already told you that this is the sum of the meta analysis that uh, we have to do surgery within 48 hours so what are the red flags for a herniated disc a uh, wrong patient a patient who is off work for more than 3 years and is taking compensation that patient is very likely not to not respond uh, to surgery if there is a question of diagnosis whether you you are not sure whether it is coming from the disc herniation if you are not sure of the level where it is coming from and a painless disc herniation i would be very reluctant to operate on a patient with painless disc herniation just for sake of l5 weakness or paresthesia in absence of pain so these are the things which you have to you know uh may keep in mind as red flags and uh, as you can see not all patients will need surgery sometimes patient with narrow canal with minimal disc bulge may need surgery whereas patients who have got capacious canal with big disc herniation can escape surgery so anatomy also plays a big role 
<laughs> and especially in congenital stenosis, uh, the patients can develop symptoms early and even with small disc herniation where they may need surgical management. So we have to go by clinical as well as radiological. It cannot be a single radiological call that is just showing up on the scan and there are no significant sign and symptoms and we are going ahead with the surgery. So as you can see here, the patient has got multiple disc herniation. However, the symptomatic level is right-sided L4, L5 and the management needs to be directed at that level. So surgery for lumbar disc herniation coming to types uh, most commonly is the open method, which most of the people will do as uh, you know we are trained in the medical colleges and other places is the laminectomy. Safest is just do a complete laminectomy and then do a discectomy. A uh, better way is to do a hemilaminectomy. And if you are even more advanced in your training and uh, practice, then you can do a laminotomy. And even more, then you can just do a fenestration where you remove the uh, ligamentum flavum and go and fish for the disc fragment and decompress the nerve root. So these are the main things which, which type of surgeries are there. However, in uh, recent times, uh, the minimally invasive options have come up and out of them, the microdiscectomy still remains the gold standard. Microdiscectomy simply means that doing a surgery uh, using a small incision and uh, using a microscope to you know, visualize the area better for illumination as well as magnification and removing the fragment without uh, you know, disturbing the muscle articulature and bone cutting too much in order to preserve the natural anatomy. So these are the advantages of conventional discectomy that you know you have got good surgical field, anatomic structures are there to guide you. It is a familiar zone for most of the people. Easily you can retract and uh, you know manage the roots better here. The disadvantages are that it has needs a long incision, extensive soft tissue stripping, increased blood loss, screen scarring, and activity limitations. Now the most uh, uh, common is the endoscopic microdiscectomy after microdiscectomy where you know you can use a tube and you can go and do a microdiscectomy. It is a percutaneous procedure and uh, it uh, combines the best of both worlds where you can do a microdiscectomy through a tube and uh, it can help you visualize better and the muscle stripping is not there. You just go and make the plane through the muscles and do the requisite uh, job which is required to remove the disc herniation. These are the results which show that the good long-term results are possible with the conventional discectomy also and most of the people will be thankful uh, that they underwent the surgery if the indications were right. However, we have to note that there is a small group of patients who will not benefit and uh, they will be labeled as failed back syndrome, which can happen in about 5 to 25 percent of patients. This was the term which was coined in mid 1950s. It is uh, characterized by chronic severe low back pain or leg pain that occurs after low back surgery. And uh, it can also occur post lumbar discectomy as it can be possibly because of the lumbar canal stenosis or other reasons, which I will come back to later. So these are the things which are there, which can cause a failed back syndrome. Recurrent disc is the most common. Then spinal stenosis, which can be central or lateral. Spinal segment instability, epidural fibrosis, arachnoiditis and discitis. So which can lead to extensive scarring even after healing. And some extra spinal problems. Uh, like pancreatitis, diabetes, you know, psychosomatic disorders and compensation related secondary gain issues. So wrong level is something most I will teach all my fellows and uh, trainees that most common problem in a disc surgery is a wrong level surgery. So you should always check it thrice, one before starting, one before doing the laminotomy. And finally, once you are in the disc space, you should check that you have decompressed the correct disc space. Because once the patient is out, it is very difficult to bring him back and also it has got big medical legal implications. Most of the time, the wrong level surgery happens because we are not able to assess the anatomy properly. There can be lumbarization or sacralization which can lead to counting errors and therefore I usually label them as last mobile segment in order not to confuse with the lumbarization or sacralization. Also exposure related because when you, especially when you are doing smaller incisions like microdiscectomy using microscope or microendoscopic discectomy, you can 
lead to you can easily wander off to another level and you know uh, get lost in the small exposure siam localization has to be correct especially when there is some amount of scoliosis or any other problem then you might land up in the level above or below so as you can see here this is the way we put a needle we check the needle on a lateral view before starting the procedure then we check once we have entered the canal and then finally once we are done these are the things which we have to avoid when doing the disc surgery the catastrophic ones i am showing here first is that you are not able to identify the root and the dura properly and instead of putting an incision on the disc you go and put the incision directly on the dura that can lead to traumatic uh, nerve injury as well as csf leak second is if you go too far inside the uh, anterior you can rupture the iliac veins or the aorta so my uh, safety net is that i always uh, try and do only fragmentectomy and try and fish for loose fragments and then use water to do a hydro dissection and then again remove loose fragments also i go to the front then withdraw my pituitary and then take a bite it's not that i go deep and just keep on biting biting there and then there's another risk is that when you are using the curve forceps you can go and go inside the dura so you have to be under the annulus make sure that you are under the annulus when you are doing this maneuver and going on the other side so this is a technique for lateral recess decompression you have to go and decompress the recess because there are three components to the disc surgery one is you have to take out the protruded fragment second you have to decompress the nerve third you have to decompress the recess so all are equally important and fourth is to fish for loose fragments in order to prevent the risk of recurrence hence it is very important to undercut the facet where it is grown and try and free the nerve root so how much disc we should remove this is always a question which no one is able to answer because if you remove too little the risk of recurrence is very high if you remove remove too much subsidence is high so ideal case would be that you only remove the loose fragments but life is not ideal most of the times so the balance is that you go and take the fragment which is impinging and then search for the loose fragments and not to do very aggressive discectomy however you need to tell the patients that why you are not going for aggressive discectomy because it can lead to later subsidence and uh, recess compressions also it can lead to you know asymmetrical uh, disc collapse and that can lead to persistent nerve root irritation and back pain also so that is why i prefer to take out only the loose fragment and then the other fragments which are inside the disc which are loose and they can come out further so this is a microendoscopic discectomy which we do we use a tube first there is a there is a guide wire then you put a first uh, dilator then you continue to put dilators and then finally you thread the tube over the dilators once you are there then you can either use a tube or you can put a microscope over it to do the discectomy the approach is very similar to micro endos uh, uh, to micro discectomy where you erase the muscles from the spinous process and go up to the lateral border of the facet here what you do is you 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 go and uh, you uh, here you go sorry just give me ha uh, here you put a tube which goes and dilates the muscle instead of stripping it off from the attachments in the spinous process and the facet joints you just uh, make a path through and do the same procedure so surgery is essentially the same however the access is better and the patient has got faster recovery as shown in some studies as you can see here this is the position some people adopt you know knee and chest position that opens up the canal you can also use wilson frame or also you can use bolsters however the the height of the bolster should be high so that the knees are able to flex and you can have a the better space to access the disc space uh, as you can see here this is a patient who had uh, pre op disc herniation and uh, this is the uh, two year post op scan and it was done through microendoscopic discectomy where the incision size is about 1.5 to 2 cm only uh, coming to the complications most common is csf leak uh, so what to do when you do a when you have a csf leak you lower the head end of the table pack gently if you can repair the dural tear you repair it by 4 4 5 or 6 whatever is your comfortable suture with a round body and then you know you 
put a glue or a patch over it and post op you can do foot end elevation you can sometimes do drugs such as acetazolamide and uh, in our practice we mobilize them late so that you know it gives some time for them to heal so when to do fusion so usually i would uh, be tended to do fusion as a, a salvage option when there is a recurrence of disc herniation however in some cases where the disc is very large and the patient is also elderly i would prefer to do a fusion rather than just doing a discectomy this was very popular in 60s and 70s however over a period of time in young patients the people would prefer to do a discectomy rather than a fusion fusion is to be kept as an option as a salvage option in primary cases of disc herniation so uh, summing it up uh, lumbar fusion is required only when there is segmental stability instability high demand patients such as manual laborer and athletes and in recurrent disc herniation this is the patient who went micro discectomy and 3 uh, years post op had a recurrent large disc herniation this patient underwent fusion t lift decompression thank you very much thank you sir thank you for such a elaborate very, very nice talk on this lumbar disc now i'll like to uh, call upon our next speaker dr samujit basu sir he is a senior consultant spine surgeon in kothari medical center kolkata sir uh, thanks navin uh, can i share my screen yeah yeah, yeah just let me stop share yeah is my screen visible yes yes sir. amajit yes i can see you good evening sir hi <laughs> it's nice to meet you virtually after a long time so uh, thanks uh, navin and thanks uh, to the association for giving me an opportunity to present some tips and tricks of spondylolisthesis management this topic is a very very favorite topic of dr jaiswal sir and uh, he has been instrumental in instilling a lot of thought processes into the management of this very common but occasionally extremely difficult pathology to deal with everybody would agree that this is a patient whom every one of us see in our day to day practice and it is important to understand that spondylolisthesis is a huge spectrum and to pick up which point of the spectrum are you going to treat this patient is the only challenge if you look at the classification it started off with the classic newman classification wilson newman classification of grade 1 type 1 which is dysplastic with a congenital deficiency of the l5 s1 facet joint type 2 which is isthmic in which the entire gamut is in the pars either it is a lytic defect or an elongated pars or an acute pars fracture type 2a which is the typical lytic listhesis that we see is very common type 3 is degenerative which is again an extremely common uh, it comes with stenosis in the elderly as abhishek was telling us all about type 4 is a traumatic one without a pars fracture if you look at type 2c in which there is an acute pars fracture which is typically in uh, high velocity sports injuries or rather uh, high demand back in a typical sports person like an athlete or a rugby player or a football player they have a a serrated margin at the at an, an acute back pain and on x ray or ct you can find that there is a very sharp acute fracture without any major displacement whereas in type 4 which is a traumatic without pars fracture there is a lot of displacement and if you do a good quality 3d ct scan you will find that there is a facetal dislocation rather than a pars fracture and the final one is a pathologic which uh, like osteoporosis and tuberculosis is occasionally seen it's not very common i'll rush through a few examples before going on to further details about the tips and tricks so dysplastic is one in which there is a typical kyphotic deformity and uh, dome shaped sacrum and the most common uh, surgery which is done is a single or a two level fusion with a reduction and a cage situated exactly at the l5s1 disc space 
Type 2 is a typical lytic defect. This is a very, very old picture, which I still share. This is a Steffi plate I did about 20 years back. And you can see that there is a big ilia crest bone graft. We've forgotten all of these once the cages have come into the picture. And that is a, a typical cliff surgery, which has been done with ilia crest bone graft. And this is uh, uh, similarly a postrolateral fusion. And you can see this, uh, not always do we find this huge fluffy postlateral fusion mass, but in some patients, it really does very well. Now, elongated parse is something which is occasionally seen, and this is a typical example of an elongated parse. And this, as you can see, is an acute parse fracture in which there is no major displacement, only a fracture in the parse, a small fracture in the parse. Now, a degenerative, which is the type 4, is very commonly seen in elderly patients with spinal canal stenosis. And the lumbar stenosis is typically uh, an insight to fusion with a large decompression, which might be extended to two levels or three levels, depending upon your necessity. Now, I will show you this example of a type 4, which is a large spondylolisthesis with a kyphosis here, and as you can see that we've been able to restore the uh, patient with its uh, typical lordosis in the lumbar spine. And what is important to understand is that there is a large facetal glabe, which is a facetal dislocation with an intact parse. You can see the parse is intact, but there is a large gap in the facet joint. And this is an example, again, a very old example for steffi plating, which a fusion was done for a TB patient who's not responding to antitubercular drugs, and they always go on for autofusion. Now, this type five types, which was then simplified by the Wilson Newman McNair, uh, by the Marchetti and Bartolosi classification, in which he said that type one and type two are basically developmental. Either there is a, a defect or a lysis in the isthmus, or there is a dysplastic one, which the L5S1 facet joint is dysplastic. The sacrum is dysplastic, dome shape is a trapezoidal vertebral body of L5 and so on. And they can be subclassified into high grade and low grade. And the rest of them entirely are acquired spondylolisthesis. And it is important to realize that acquired spondylolisthesis and low grade developmental spondylolisthesis, they are one bag of patients which can be treated similarly and which have a very similar history of natural history of progression, whereas high grade is a completely different ballgame. And com developmental high grade listhesis is a major surgical challenge with a typical adolescent boy or girl presenting to you with back pain, hamstring spasm, a pelvic kyphosis, and occasionally it can be really, really a very difficult issue to treat. Now, if you look at the treatment options of surgery versus conservative, the fusion can be either PLF, which is postulatal fusion, or TLIF or an ELIF. Now, this is a pictorial representation of a uh, postulatal fusion, uninstrumented and instrumented. And we have seen that there are various studies which prove that uh, there is a good clinical outcome with postulateral fusion in low-grade lysthesis, grades 1 and 2, whereas if you, uh, you have to give an interbody support, that means an anterior interbody fusion or a posterior lumbar interbody fusion is must for uh, high-grade spondylolisthesis, typically types 3 and 4. And if you look at low-grade lysthesis versus high-grade lysthesis, the major difference in surgical approach is that in high-grade lysthesis, if you really reduce, if you are doing an inside effusion, you might get away without doing an anterior interbody work and with an interbody work. But if you are doing a low-grade lysthesis, you are jolly well uh, quite secure with a good instrumentation and a postulateral fusion. Now, the next issue is what are the levels of fusion? For all low-grade, monosegmental is adequate. High-grade, polysegmental may be required, may not be required. As I shall go through a few examples, I shall try to tell you the tips and tricks of choosing whom to be polysegmental and whom to be monosegmental in high-grade spondies. Now, a graft or a cage, we know that anterior column support in cliff is mandatory with a cage, which significantly increases the construct stiffness as well as maintains the disc height and provides channels for bone growth. Now, the next is reduction, yes or no. 
and whether there is spinal instrumentation. Now, basically, reduction gives us a correction of the deformity and hence restores the deranged lumbopelvic biomechanics and restores the sagittal balance. Whereas, also, it gives a good cross-sectional area for interbody fusion. Now, uh, with the current classification systems coming in, there are recommendations of reduction, which I shall go through if time permits. Now, uh, we know that it is not only a question of the slip, but also a major question is the kyphotic deformity of the lumbosacral spine. And if you have a spondylolisthesis with a high-grade slip, grades 3 or 4, with a kyphotic L5-S1, uh, motion segment, then your main idea is to reduce the kyphosis and to make it at least parallel to each other. Even if you have some residual slip, it doesn't matter. What matters is the correction of the kyphosis. Now, let us talk about some recent trends and some recent controversies. The first and foremost is, as I was telling you a few minutes back, is do we really need to reduce all of them? Is there a role of neuromonitoring? when to go to L4 and when to go to below the sacrum, that's the pelvis. And there are patients who have scoliosis, which are occasionally very troublesome, very progressive, and we need to know which scoliosis requires uh, addressing that problem and which does not. Now, first is, do we need to reduce all? This leads us to our current understanding of this pathology on the basis of pelvic incidence and spinopelvic balance. A lot of publication has come across, and Lebel's publication has now come out in the full, full uh, stage classification. Uh, we all know about the pelvic parameters, and uh, I would not go into the details of them, but we need to know that pelvic incidence is pelvic tilt plus sacral slope. Similarly, there are some other parameters like thoracic kyphosis, lumbar nodosis, and C7 PL. But this classification of Hubert Lebel which is the SDSG classification has come out very well. And this spine deformity study group, which is SDSG, L5-S1 spondylolisthesis classification is now very acceptable across the globe in which they have classified L5-S1 spondy into low grade and high grade. Low grades are type one, two, three, as you can see, depending upon the pelvic incidence. If the pelvic incidence is low, that is below 45 degrees, it is known as nut cracker, which is type 1. Type 2 is with the normal pelvic incidence, 45 to 60, and type 3 is a high PI, which means basically high PI means a high uh, hyperlordosis of the spine, and this is high PI. And so all these are low grade, grade 1 or 2, and the high grades are again subclassified into type 4, 5, 6. In the 4, it is a balanced pelvis, that means the pelvis is not retroverted to compensate for the lumbosacral kyphosis. And in type 5 and 6, either it is a retroverted pelvis only with a balanced spine, or it is a retroverted pelvis along with an unbalanced spine. That means there is a sagittal offset because the patient stoops forwards. Let us see a few examples, and then I can tell you about this in further details. Now, this is an example of a young boy. He's quite young, he's about nine years, which had a high-grade spondylolisthesis. And important it is to realize that it is very high-grade, not only from the slip point of view, but for the kyphosis point of view. And let us look at, uh, again, uh, the recommendation, that is, for all these patients, one, two, three, and four, you might get away with a, without a major reduction. But if it is a retroverted pelvis, even with or without an unbalanced spine, that means type five and six, it is extremely important to go for a proper reduction. Otherwise, the chances of failure are quite high. Now, going into the next concept of, is there a role of neural monitoring? Now, uh, foot drop, which is the dreaded complication of reduction of high-grade spondylolisthesis, doesn't happen in all patients. Let's look at again a clinical example. As I've told you before, that the whole spine X-rays are critically important to evaluate because this is a high-grade uh, spondylolisthesis where you can see that the sacrum is pretty vertical here, and that means that there's a lot of pelvic retroversion which is going on. And if you look at this standing X-rays, you see that the L5 is toppling over and the S1 is vertically up, which basically means that this needs to be reduced. And 
I will not go into the uh, very details of this. This is how we do it uh, with the neural monitoring. You see, this is the cranial part of the patient. This is the caudal part. And this is the flat dural dissector where I am after the decompression is done, after the screws have been put in, and that is where I am putting in the paravertebral uh, electrode, and this electrode is on the exiting route. So this is where the exiting route is. This is the L S1 route. There is a patty which uh, retracts the S1 route, and this is how the is a, you can you saw the stimulation which was happening, and now this stimulation is recorded, and after. Uh, the reduction has been completed. The stimulation is again done. You see now I'm stimulating it with a lesser um, uh, current. So this is the L5 exiting route, which is stim getting stimulated. And this time the jerk is, you will see a little bit less. So that means this is the threshold of micro. Uh, they usually go up to 10 micro, uh, microvolts, millivolts, sorry. And if that produces a response. That means after reduction also your response should come at around 4 to 6 to 8. If it um, requires say some 20 millivolts or 30 millivolts of uh, excitation to produce this jerk, that means the L5 root may have been damaged because the, the threshold has increased. So this is the x-ray of the post-operative x-ray of this patient. You can see this kyphosis has been converted to a uh, parallel L5-S1 disk space and the cage is produced anteriorly so that we can compress over this locked cage to, to correct this deformity. And this is the patient pre-operative, post-operatively. You can see that there is a good correction of this lumbosacral kyphosis, which is producing this hamstring spasm leading to a knee uh, flexion contracture and now after the surgery, this is immediately after the surgery, she is pretty straightened up with significant improvement of the sagittal profile and the hamstring spasm. There's another example. I would not go into the details of that. Now next, let us go to when to go to L4. Do all patients go, need to go to L4? Now, uh, this is a very uh, pretty old publication of Claudio Lamartine, in which it is shown that if you can draw a square and that square, it's this is not very well accepted across the globe, but this gives you a reasonably good understanding that if you're Fusion mass needs to uh, go out to L4. That means this square which he developed meets the criteria that the, either the L4 is outside or into the square. If it is into the square, then you can stop at L5. If it is out, then you have to go to L4. Now, uh, current generation instrumentation systems allow us to go to the pelvis, but not all patients would be required to be taken up to the pelvis. I'll give you an example in which I went to the pelvis. This is a highly osteoporotic lady in which, as you can see, that there is a significant grade three slip inflection, which corrects hardly in extension. So reducing this, other than by positioning, it is going to be a very major challenge. As you can see that she's highly osteoporotic. Her bone mineral density was less than minus 2.5. So in this patient, we accepted whatever positioning we got in the positioning, or whatever reduction we got in the positioning, and we went from L4 to the pelvis. We put in S2EI screws. These are the uh, L4 screws, L5 screws, S1 screws, and then this is the S2EI screws. And this is the cage. The, we, we did get a reasonably good uh, reduction on positioning, but the problem is if we have such a beautiful reduction on positioning itself, and if you do a monosegmental with such an osteoporotic bone quality, this is going to slip and you're going to lose the reduction very soon. So that's why it's important that we go higher up, involve more levels, put her on teriparatide and observe her and she did well. Well, finally, I can put in a couple of slides regarding whether the scoliosis requires surgery or not. Uh, let us look at this girl. This is again a young 12-year-old uh, girl, just uh, into uh, a couple of uh, a year after her Menard. And this is how she looks like standing and supine. You can see that standing X-rays shows a typical high-grade L5 response spondylolisthesis. And if you look at the whole spine X-rays, it is a type 6. That is because you can see that the C7 plumb line is way beyond the hips. That means there is a huge amount of sagittal imbalance along with a retroverted pelvis. So this is a type 6 and there is a significant scoliosis of the lumbar level. In these patients, you, you can see that 
there is a very significant compression on the lumbar canal and the space at the level of the L5S1 available for the neural structures is grossly diminished. Now, this is the post-operative X-ray of this patient. And this is the post-operative X-ray so far as the sagittal profile is concerned. So immediate post-op, we did get a good reduction. You can see that the disc space has now got built up. And uh, for the last few years, I've been using titanium cages for all this so that I can check the position of the rotation, uh, how much this cage could be rotated. So this is fully rotated. There's a good medialization of the L5 and S1 screws, which is critically important because otherwise the reduction would not hold. And this is the cage nicely positioned in the L5 S1 disc space, which is also led to jacking up of the collapsed L5 S1 disc space, leading to a good foraminal clearance. But if you look at the sagittal profile, her patient's sagittal profile has definitely improved a lot after surgery. And we chose to hang around and not address the scoliosis, showed her some exercises and encouraged her to get back into sports activities and normal life. And this is her uh, pre-operative and post-operative. You can see that there is a good correction of the sagittal profile as well as the coronal profile after surgery. Now, this is a 24 months follow-up X-ray. As you can see that the lumbar scoliosis is nearly got well corrected. It's a standing X-ray. And this is what she looks like after two years. This is the two years follow-up X-ray. It is completely straightened up. And the sagittal profile remains like this with a well-balanced spine and an adequate lumbar nodosis with a normal antiverted pelvis. So the take-home messages of this talk would be identify the type of spondylolisthesis in expected behavioral pattern rather than classifying it medicalistically. Study the association with the pelvic parameters. In the last 10 years, the, across the world, we have a lot of focus on these pelvic parameters. Look at the overall pelvic and spinal balance. Check out whether the pelvis is retroverted or not and check out whether they have got adequate spinal balance. That means the plumb line should be approximately two and a half centimeters plus minus the sacrum monitoring and then only chalk out a treatment strategy. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, sir, for such an extensive talk and taking us through all the basics of spinal anesthesis. It was a very nice one. I'll request Jaiswal, sir, to uh, give some tips as he has done extensive work on high-grade spinal anesthesis. Sir. Thanks, Nadeen. I mean, after such an exhaustive and such a, you know, uh, skillful presentation by Swamijit Basu, I don't think I need to say anything like this. There's just a couple of uh, uh, points uh, that I'd like to give in from this talk, yes. after this talk, is that for for uh, average spine surgeon or, of an av of a, or a orthopedic surgeon who's doing a bit of spine surgery, the low-grade spondylolisthesis can be tackled. But the high-grade spondylolisthesis should be, should be a very specialized uh, a branch, a specialized uh, treatment is required and should be referred to a center who, who's routinely doing it. I mean, Dr. Basu made it so simple. It's not really that simple. Otherwise, it's a lot with problems and, you know, when to reduce and how to reduce. You cannot just learn in a, in a webinar. So the, my, my message would be the spondyl low-grade listesis, especially the degen types, can be done. And a good decompression is what you need to do with, with stabilization, as Dr. Basu rightly pointed out. But the high-grade ones has to be referred to a specialized center and has to be treated as a spinal deformity. As, as rightly pointed out, there's a kyphoscoriosis and lumbosacral, which should be rightly addressed. And you have to correct the straight and a vertical uh, pelvis otherwise it gives highlights to a lot of problems you know the the other other thing is when you see a scoliosis right it is very essential even in idiopathic scoliosis it is very essential that you or you get the the lumbosacral spine evaluated lumbosacral junction because there as as the last case we saw dr basu said was an olisthesis, right? Where, where the spondyolisthesis was there, and because of the defect of L5, L5S1, the top link, it also turns laterally to giving back to scoliosis. So all idiopathic scoliosis should be 
proper disc at least the lumbosacral spine should be focused there. If you have a long-standing scoliosis X-ray, at times you miss the L5-S1 uh, region and, and they may be, the main cause may be a high-grade spondy and the scoliosis may just be a, a sort of a correcting mechanism there. So these are the two points that I would like, like to emphasize. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. All those, Tommy, all you those... agree with me? Thanks, sir. All those wisdom comes in uh, always, always. It's always like uh, a relearning from you. You don't, needn't go to, go and express on my and comment on my gray hair. You're trying to say that, is it? <laughs> Over to you, Naveen. Yeah. Sir, yeah. Thank you, sir. And now if I'll there are any questions from the house, you know, we'll take them out. Yeah, we can, sir, take them at the last, sir. At the last. Okay, right. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Sir, I'd like to call our next speaker, Dr. Tarun Sui, sir. He is a head, head of department spine surgery in Amrita Hospital, Faridabad. Sir, please. Yeah. Thank you, Naveen. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, thank you, uh, Naveen, uh, Dr. Puneet Gupta, Dr. Puneet Agarwal, and the International Orthopedic Association for this wonderful initiative, where we are getting to listen to such stalwarts and such wonderful talks. Uh, and uh, my sincere regards to my teachers, Dr. Uh, Basu, uh, Dr. Arvind Jaiswal. And a very good evening to Dr. Abhishek Srivastav and uh, Pankaj. So, uh, so I, uh, I'll be speaking on uh, the tips and techniques of lumbar and thoracic pedicle screw insertion. So, let me just share my screen. Okay. So is it visible, Naveen? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, so this is a picture which I want uh, the orthopedic surgeons uh, to see that this is what we all would not like to see in our cases and would not like to do. So that is the importance of learning the proper techniques of pedicle screw insertion because they will not be just a cause of significant morbidity to the patients, but they will have huge medical legal implications if the screws are significantly misplaced like this and they can cause uh, a lot of anatomical damage. So uh, just a brief uh, brush up of the relevant pedicle anatomy. As you all know that pedicle is a bony structure, tubular, which connects the vertebral body to the posterior elements. And uh, the important relations of pedicles are, is that it is related to uh, the nerve root inferiorly, which hugs the lower border of the pedicle. And uh, on the medial aspect of the pedicle is a dural sac, which uh, may contain spinal cord or cord icon and nerve roots, depending upon what level we are dealing with. So the pedicle is a funnel-shaped structure with a cancerous mouth and uh, the base of the uh, pedicle is a narrow uh, uh, structure called as uh, isthmus and uh, the diameter of uh, this isthmus is basically what detects uh, which decides how much uh, size of the pedicle screw we can insert into the vertebral body. And this leads to an open uh, roomy cancerous vertebral body where the screw finally gets its purchase. So just a, a brief uh, overview of what we have to look at, uh, look at the lumbar spine uh, or uh, spine x-rays in the AP and lateral views, uh, we should be able to identify the pedicles and the normal anatomy of the spine because if there is any anomaly uh, aberration in the, uh, in the anatomy, uh, the pedicle size are uh, dysmorphic, uh, then uh, we can uh, plan our uh, surgical uh, trajectories and screw sizes accordingly. It is also very important to identify the pedicles on the AP view because uh, you need to see the size of the pedicles, uh, whether the pedicles are, if the pedicles are very small, that will be the first clue that you will get uh, on the x-ray and which you can confirm by getting a CT scan so that you can plan your screws. Also, these are all, these screws are very important because these are the same screw uh, views that you will see on, in the uh, in the OT on the C-arm. So you have to identify these landmarks uh, properly so that you can see the relation of these landmarks to the screws that you are inserting. Now, lumbar spine pedicle screws can be inserted by various techniques. Uh, we have open technique freehand, which is uh, essentially which is going to be the essence of this talk. Uh, but they can also be inserted by uh, CM guided or fluoroscopy technique uh, and minimally invasive techniques. Newer techniques such as navigation and intraoperative CT are also useful in uh, pedicle screw insertion. But the freehand technique remains the workhouse of uh, orthopedic and a spine surgeon. So positioning for uh, lumbar spine surgery from uh, fixation of pedicle screw insertion point of view is extremely important. Uh, Dr. Abhishek in his talk pointed out the positioning for a lumbar discectomy, uh, which is shown in the upper two figures. And uh, you can see that the in the above two figures, the hips are flexed. So the lumbar spine is either flat or it is convex. 
So this helps up in opening up the disk spaces when you want to do minimally invasive decompression and do less of bony resection. But uh, this is not the anatomical position. The anatomical position for lumbar spine is lumbar lordosis, and we need to restore that if you want to instrument the lumbar spine with the help of pedicle stools. And hence, the hips should be in a neutral alignment uh, as far as possible so that to achieve the lumbar lordosis in which it can be fixed. Uh, coming to the exposure uh, after proper prone positioning uh, with hips not in too much flexion and lumbar lordosis maintained, we infiltrate the skin with the uh, 1 into 2 lakhs uh, uh, solution of adrenaline and uh, proper illumination uh, with the help of proper instrumentation and cautery is extremely essential to get a good exposure in a bloodless skin so that screws can be properly inserted. Uh, in this figure, you can see the red, uh, all the red areas, areas are the uh, mus muscles and uh, we need to do deep dissection in three stages. In first stage, we remove uh, the muscles from spinous process to placid capsules and uh, care should be taken to take care of the capsule at the uppermost uh, instrumented vertebra or uppermost two because we don't want to violate the uh, placid capsule which is a, a protector for preventing pro uh, proximal junctional kyphosis. The second, uh, in the second stage, we remove the muscle beyond the facet joints. And in the third stage, we expose laterally to transverse process. Uh, we avoid going too much lateral beyond the tip or the upper and the lower part of the transverse process because it is an extremely vascular area. And um, the bleeding, if it occurs at this uh, location, it often retracts into deeper uh, layers. And it is very difficult to become uh, to uh, get an hemostasis. Uh, now, uh, in the insertion techniques, uh, we have to define the entry point, uh, which can, uh, which varies uh, from whether we are ins uh, inserting a lumbar pedicle screw or a thoracic pedicle screw. Then we have to uh, open the cortex, uh, making a pilot hole. This is followed by a probe insertion, which is the lengthiest probe, which we most commonly use, followed by determining the screw length and diameter, tapping and screw insertion. So we will uh, touch all these uh, points one by one. So uh, first of all is the entry point for lumbar pedicle screw. The most common technique which is used for uh, determining the entry point of the lumbar pedicle screw is the intersection technique in which we take the midline of the base of transverse process and we take a vertical line along the lateral aspect of the facet joint. And at this intersection, we make a pilot hole with the help of a, either a nibbler and all or a high speed bulb to make an entry into the pedicle channel. Now, sometimes uh, determining uh, uh, the exact uh, uh, location of the facet joint is difficult during the surgery, especially if you are dealing with a degenerative spine where huge osteophytes may be obscuring the facet joints and you may not be able to uh, identify the landmarks. In this case, uh, in this uh, kind of uh, situation, a rocking technique where you can rock the spinous process as shown in this video, uh, you can do the rocking of the spinous process with the nibbler and to see where the movement is happening and identify the facet joint. Next is opening up the cortex, which, as I mentioned, can be with the help of nibbler or with the help of high speed bird, if you have one in the OT. And on doing so, a uh, cancellous uh, bone is exposed uh, of the pedicle, which is called as a pedicle blush. And uh, following this, uh, we make uh, the end, uh, we make uh, further uh, uh, advance it with the help of all, or and uh, followed by using uh, a lengthy probe, which is uh, shown in this figure. The lengthy probe is a curved shaped probe uh, where uh, uh, we insert the lengthy probe with a curve facing laterally initially. Now, the uh, idea of this doing this uh, is uh, something called as gear shift technique. We want to insert the probe uh, with the curve point with the point facing laterally initially because we don't violate, don't want to violate the medial border of the pedicle. And uh, when we negotiate the pedicle, which is usually at the depth of 15 to 20 millimeters, we take out the probe and uh, we then uh, insert the, uh, yeah. So we then insert the, uh, uh, the probe in uh, a change direction in which the, uh, the probe is medialized so that it enters into the vertebral body. Now this probing is done by a slow twisting movement so that the pedicle, uh, the lengthy probe, it's find its way through the cancellous uh, bony channel and any amount of force should not be done. Hammering should be avoided because uh, uh, by doing so, we will not uh, 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 will not be able to realize uh, when we are violating the medial wall and that can lead to a serious uh, medial or a lateral wall breach. The next step is, now the next step is uh, determining the craniocaudal direction of uh, the pedicles too. Now in terms of uh, lumbar spine, if you look at this graph, uh, you'll be able to realize that uh, uh, the uh, craniocaudal angulation at L3, L4 is nearly zero degrees. So uh, in simple words, the L3, L4 screws, they all, L3 screw almost goes vertically downwards when you're positioned the patient properly. 
the L4 and the L5 screws, they are uh, directed cordially, and uh, the L1 and the L2 screws are directed slightly cranially. The S1 screw is directed extremely cordially, and it is very important to direct, uh, give adequate cordial direction so that the screw does not violate the L5-S1 disk space. Coming to the medial lateral inclination, uh, uh, as again we can see in this graph, uh, that uh, the medial axial angulation is about 5 degrees medial at L1. And as we go down from L1 towards S1, we can uh, add 5 degrees just to remember as to how much medial angulation we have to do. So we have to add 5 degrees for each lower level so that by the time we reach L5, it's about 25 degrees. And for S1, it's a highly metallized screw at about 25 to 30 degrees. Uh, so this was about the lumbar uh, um, pedicle screws. Uh, now sacrum has a slightly different uh, pedicle screw insertion technique. Uh, the lumbar, uh, the sacral uh, S1 pedicle screw entry point is determined by intersection of the two lines. Uh, the two lines are horizontal line along the inferior border of the S1 facet and vertical line along, again along the lateral border of the S1 facet. So on uh, opening the entry point here with the help of a bar or a nibbler, uh, we open up the pedicle with the help of an awl and then again use a lengthy probe. And the direction of screw is such that uh, the screws are converged about 25 to 30 degrees medially, as discussed uh, in the previous slides. And we have to aim towards the sacral promontory to get a tricortical purchase of the sacral pedicle screw. So after uh, probing with the Lenke probe, we now have to sound the pedicle track that we have prepared, and we have to palpate all the four walls, and the pal we have to palpate the floor. Most important are the medial and the inferior wall because they are in relation to the thecal sac and in relation to the nerve root, which is hugging the pedicle inferiorly. And once we ensure that all the walls and the floor of the tract are intact, we plug it with bone wax so that excessive bleeding does not occur while we are preparing the other tracks. Uh, it is extremely important to be very gentle at this stage, even with the pedicle sound, which looks to be a very, very uh, delicate instrument in an osteoporotic bone. Because in an osteoporotic bone, even this pedicle sound can cause a violation of any of these walls or the floor. So this is just a revision of the steps that we have discussed. Uh, we determine the entry point by intersection technique by determining these two lines. We open up the end, uh, entry point with the help of a nibbler, uh, followed by an awl. Following this, we use a lengthy probe to cannulate the pedicle. And uh, after cannulating, we check uh, its integrity, the integrity of all the four walls with the help of a pedicle sound. So after doing this, the next step is the confirming the position of ball probes putting put into all the pedicle tracks that you have prepared under CR. It is very important to determine both AP and lateral views. Sometimes we find it difficult to bring the CR again uh, into AP view, and we want to uh, just remain assured on lateral view that the tracks are going in the, the ball probes are going to the right direction. But it is extremely important that you see the AP view and see that the pedicle probes are going into the pedicles and there is no medial or lateral breach. You have to determine the length of the pedicle screw with the, also with the help at this stage, uh, the ideal length being 70 to 80 percent of the vertebral body width. So you can see in this L45 S1 fixation, we have put six probes and we have checked them on the AP and lateral views. It is also important that on the AP views that none of the probes should be crossing the midline, which may be indicative of a medial breach. So this is how you see the pedicles on the AP view on the CR, and it is extremely important to see the relation of the ball probes in relation to the pedicle uh, anatomy. Next step uh, after confirming that the screws are in correct position is doing the tapping. Uh, now tapping uh, has been uh, shown in biomechanical studies that excessive tapping can reduce the insertional torque of the pedicle screw. So uh, the tapping can be avoided or uh, the screw track can be under tapped by one millimeter. So that, for example, if you're putting a 6.5 mm screw, you can use a 5.5 mm tap just to uh, uh, make an initial uh, uh, entry into the pedicle. And after tapping, we have to check with the sound again so the, to confirm that the uh, tap has not violated any of the pedicle walls. This is followed by the screw insertion, which has to be inserted in a slow speed so that you allow the pedicle to expand and accommodate the pedicle screw. And uh, while doing so, we also have to assess the purchase of the bone quality to assess the stability of the construct. We have to ensure that all the threads go inside uh, the pedicle and the screw head should not be excessively buried, especially in a polyaxial screw. Otherwise, you lose the advantage of the tulip uh, by converting into a monoaxial one. After doing so, it is extremely important to again check the AP and lateral views 
to see that your pedicle screws have gone in the wrong direction, in the right direction. Don't rely that you had checked the ball probes and everything was fine because on, at this stage also there may be an error which can be picked up. For example, in the in the case that I had showed uh, shown you in the previous slides, uh, we had inserted the screws and on putting the screws and checking the APU, we found that one of the L4 screws was directly laterally and was not in the pedicle. So this was revised and a properly uh, medially directed screw was inserted. And we could have missed this if we would have checked only the lateral view and skipped the AP view. Now, screws can be malpositioned, uh, and uh, the consequences of malposition are extremely dangerous. They can be a medial breach, uh, damaging the dural sac, causing the uh, CSF leak or a neural damage. Anterior uh, excessive protrusion and uh, lengthy screws can uh, damage the uh, great vessels. Uh, the inferior uh, breach can or placement can cause uh, damage to the inferior or exiting nerve root, and a superior uh, protrusion uh, or entry into the disc space can cause damage to the disc space and its degeneration and leads to a less purchase, uh, poor purchase of the pedicle screw. Now, coming to the thoracic pedicle screws, the anatomy of thoracic pedicle screws is slightly different as compared to lumbar pedicle screws because the facet joints are uh, oriented in a coronal plane as compared to lumbar pedicle screws where the facets are in sagittal plane. The pedicles in a thoracic spine, they attach to the superior part of the body as compared to the pedicles in the lumbar spine where they attach in uh, around the middle of the body. The pedicle sizes are smaller, so you have to be very careful while doing the probing and the screw sizes that you have put are smaller in diameter also and length also. And it is important that you're dealing with spinal cord instead of the cordic one and the in the lumbar spine so that you have to be extra careful that there is no medial breach which can cause a significant neurological deficit. And in the thoracic spine, the entry points and the starting points uh, 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 and directions are slightly different from a, uh, from a lumbar pedicle screw. For medial lateral starting point determination, we use a superior facet tool where we expose the superior facet of the, uh, the vertebra being instrumented and we divide the superior facet uh, into three parts. And it is important that uh, we uh, stay uh, away from the medial two thirds of the superior articular facet. Uh, for the entry point because that can lead to a medial breach. The starting point ideally should be two to three meter millimeters lateral to the midline of the superior articular facet. So if we stay in the lateral one third of the superior articular facet, that is a safe zone for starting the entry point of a thoracic pedicle screw. The craniocaudal starting point is variable depending upon the levels, uh, but the general rule is that we have to be in the superior part of the transverse process as compared to lumbar spine, where we were bisecting it and we're remaining in middle. So uh, in thoracic spine, except in T1, T2, T3, and T12, where we can take the bisector of TP, all the other uh, vertebrae, the uh, craniocaudal starting point is in the proximal one third of transverse process or at the proximal ridge of the transverse process. Okay. So in the beginning, you have, can uh, uh, keep this start in your uh, in a theater in front of you to determine which vertebra are you are instrumenting and using a proper entry point uh, from that perspective. But to make it simple, uh, in thoracic spine, the craniocaudal starting point is in the proximal one third of the transverse process. So after you have determined the craniocaudal starting point and um, the medial lateral starting point, uh, you also need to know the medial angulation of the transverse pedicle angle. Now transverse pedicle angle uh, or medial angulation is about 10 degrees to 15 degrees for all the thoracic pedicles, except the upper two, which is D1 and D2, in which the thoracic pedicles are uh, directed at an angle of about 25 to 30 degrees. So uh, in the, in nutshell, uh, from thoracic spine to lumbar spine, except D1, D2, L5, and S1, all the pedicles are in the range of 15 to 20 degrees. Only D1, D2, L5, and S1 are the pedicles in which the medial angulation is more than or equal to 20 degrees. The pedicle diameters is also an extremely important consideration. Uh, you have to remember that the thinnest pedicles is between T4 and T9, and the average diameter being 5 millimeter. But it is very important in the initial stages to study your MRI scans if you have with them or uh, have with you, or uh, CT scans if possible, to see that you're not dealing with uh, extremely thin pedicles. Next comes the craniocaudal angulation or the sagittal angle at which you have to put the thoracic pedicle screw. For this, we have two kinds of trajectories. Uh, one is a straightforward trajectory in which the screw ins is inserted parallel to the superior end plate. Uh, and the other is an anatomical trajectory in which the screw inserted is inserted along the axis of the pedicle. The difference is that in a straightforward trajectory, we are inserting the screw in a dense compact bone, which is just near to the end plate. And it is supposed to have a relatively uh, 
better pull out strength as compared to anatomical trajectory the advantage of uh, anatomical screw as that we are uh, getting to put a longer screw and the superior cut out chances of an anatomical trajectory are less as compared to a straight forward trajectory so um, the in the steps of thoracic pedicle screw uh, insertion there are some differences as compared to lumbar pedicle screws after doing the exposure and uh, uh, making uh, trying to make the entry points uh, we have to uh, do the facetectomy of the inferior articular process or facet of the superior vertebra now once we do this uh, this exposes a superior articular facet or process of the lower vertebra and in that we can use a superior articular facet rule to determine the correct entry point please note that we cannot do this maneuver or facetectomy uh, for the uppermost instrumented vertebra because doing so would violate the facet joint and the risk of proximal junctional kyphosis would increase so at the uppermost instrumented vertebra we have to determine the entry point without doing the facetectomy after this a high speed burr is uh, very useful if we have at this stage uh, because it gives you a more accuracy in creating a pilot pole insertion because the margin of error in in a thoracic pedicle screw is much less as compared to a lumbar pedicle screw after do, uh, doing this step again the routine is doing a probing uh, putting in a sound to check all the four walls again checking in the c arm uh, both the ap and the lateral views and doing tapping or under tapping and this is followed by the screw insertion now while inserting the screws it is important to remember that transverse process in a thoracic spine is also different from that of lumbar spine in a thoracic spine the transverse process is overhanging as compared to lumbar spine so it is important to remove the transverse process uh by before inserting the screw so that you are able to seat the screw better as compared to uh if you don't do it it also helps in better medialization of the screw it provides a bone graft because you get some bone by removing the transverse process and creates a better bed uh for fusion by exposing the underlying cancellous screw uh as a salvage option if you uh, are not able to put a thoracic pedicle screw because your pedicle anatomy is extremely challenging the pedicles are atrophic or they have uh, they are very thin or in cases where you uh, miss a uh, place a uh, misdirect uh, pedicle screw and you want to change it uh, a technique called as juxta pedicle screw or in out in technique is extremely useful in this case we take an entry point far laterally in the on the transverse process and uh, we come out of the transverse process in the costal vertebral junction and then we again enter the body so the entry point is, is far much lateral as compared to the conventional entry point and uh, this is called as an in out in technique and it is extremely useful in these challenging cases or as a salvage option so the other salvage options are if you misplace a screw that you can consider a larger diameter screw if the pedicle walls are intact so sub, suppose uh, you've inserted a 6.5 mm screw and uh, you find out that uh, it is having having a medial breach then you can remove it and try putting it a 7.5 screw if you have it available and the pedicle walls uh, are intact uh, you can change the trajectory uh, uh, by putting a different uh, uh, trajectory screws for example you can change from uh, anatomical trajectory to straight forward trajectory in the case of thoracic spine in osteoporotic bone uh, you can consider cement augmentation if uh, it is available and uh, the bone quality is extremely poor and after doing so uh, all these uh, if you are not able to get any pedicle purchase then you can consider uh, skipping that level or move to the cranial or the caudal level or you can use alternate uh, fixation options such as a wire or a hook uh, to secure fixation into that level so uh, the take home message is that uh, before you start putting in pedicle screws it is extremely important to practice first on the saw bones and cadaveric workshop initially put supervised pedicle screws uh, so that you know uh, uh, um, uh, how you uh, you have to master that technique lumbar screws are uh, easier to put and they have more uh, margin um, uh, uh, of accuracy so that uh, you can put start putting lumbar uh, pedicle screws first and then we want to thoracic it is extremely important to read your scans very well uh, the x rays mris and if uh, available ct scans to look for any aberrant anatomy or any difficult pedicles which may not be amenable to a pedicle screw fixation and uh, whenever in doubt it uh, is extremely useful to take the help of cm in the form of both ap and lateral views so that you do not uh, create any important uh, uh, any significant damage uh, to the dura or to the nerve roots thank you so much me thank you sir such uh, for taking us to a basics of putting in pedicle screws it was a very nice talk i'd like to have some inputs from jaswal sir as he has a very uh, extensive extensive experience of putting in pedicle screws in deformed spine sir please well, one of the one of the key points in putting a pedicle screw in, in a deformed spine but really let, let's talk about scoliosis is that 
to start with, we, we as a routine do CT scan and our radiologist, we tell the radiologist to do a cut in every ped, at every pedicle level. And this give us a, a printout of that. It's very important. So at every level, you know what is the trajectory of your pedicle. What is the thickness of your pedicle? As Tarun rightly had said towards the end of the talk, if the pedicles are very narrow or they are like a slit, then you can do in-out techniques. There are other techniques which you can adopt. So it's very important to understand and know what, is, what your pedicles are like, especially in a deformity case. It's very important. And with MRI, you don't get a very good idea about the type of, you can actually uh, get, uh, you know, find out, but best is to get CT done. You know, so routinely we get CT done before surgery to have this. So you have that in the OT to see the various levels and we no normally mark it out so that we are aware of where the 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 uh, pedicles are narrow. So, so then apply the other technique to do that. The other thing is, the, uh, you know, people are mostly wor worried about uh, the angulated uh, Concavity in the curve, in which you have to start a bit lateral from the from the exact uh, uh, classical entry point. You have to start a bit lateral, and you get to angulate your uh, your uh, trajectory more medially towards that. But the important thing is, as Tarun had rightly said in his diagram, the midline should be kept in mind. You do not cross the midline, the the spinous process in the AP going to the opposite side. So these, these are some of the tips that you do. And if you are ever at a doubt, in, in especially in scoliosis, skip that level. Go above, you know, so that if you're struggling, don't keep going on the same ascent. You're likely to then, then cause catastrophe. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Anything else Thank uh, you, sir. you'd like to, Tarun, add on this deformity? No, I think, sir, uh, 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 this was right. Uh, but I think, uh, Naveen, it's important that uh, for a routine orthopedic surgeon, uh, uh, they'll be mostly dealing with trauma and tuberculosis and maybe degenerative spine. So yeah. uh, for them, I think uh, uh, most of the cases that they'll be dealing uh, with, with the routine normal anatomy schools. And as Dr. Jaiswal mentioned for listeners, any difficult uh, anatomy, I think, should be, uh, should be referred to a place where uh, the person is experienced in dealing with such cases. And uh, thoracic spine is a little challenging and the margin of error and revising, getting a new track is a little difficult. So I think anything about the thoracolumbar spine should be done when you have a fair amount of experience in putting lumbar uh, spine screws. And uh, I think it should be coming uh, come in a stepwise fashion. Yeah, thanks. Like you said, sir. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to call our next speaker, Professor Pankaj Kandwal, sir. He is head of the department, AIMS case, and he's also... Chief of Program Coordinator for MC Spine Surgery. Sir, please. Thanks, Naveen, for having me. I would like to thank the organizers, Professor Puneet Gupta, Dr. Puneet Agrawal, for having me here. I sit here humble in front of Professor Jaswal, who is my teacher, who is my guide, who is my mentor. I can go on and on and on. Um, happy to see you, sir. And I take this opportunity to, to showcase my work to you and uh, and i hope i hope to make you feel proud okay so hello to tarun and uh, abhishek i hope abhishek is here i guess uh, i guess uh, dr basu has left yeah so let me share my screen uh, it's going to be a very long talk uh, i'll just try to um, try to uh, okay yeah we can't share my screen uh, Give me some time. Uh, Naveen, we can't see the screen. No, his screen is not yet shared, sir. Okay. Hello, Dr. Pankaj. Yes, um, I'm unable to share my screen. Just check. Is somebody already sharing the screen? Sharing the screen, sir. Oh, I have Hello? stopped sharing it. I stopped sharing it uh, long back. Okay, okay. Just 
Just give me a moment. Abhishek, can you help me with the with the MacBook? Why don't you? Is there a technical expert there, uh, Naveen? Do you have someone? You there is a button which is there for share screen. I can do the I I, I do that, but uh, but what's hey, sir, happening? Sir, you need some help sharing the screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's asking me to open system preferences. Uh, I need to go to settings, I guess. Uh, yes, just uh, allow the system to share the screen. Okay, yeah, yeah. give me a moment. While, while, while there is a technical problem there. Can, yes, can I take a question? Naveed? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can take can, over the can question. I take, sir. Can I take yes. a very good good question which is on the chat? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, sir, sir and the person sir. has asked domectomy in dysplastic spondylolisthesis. That is, when should you do a dome uh, excision in S1 in, in dysplastic spondylolisthesis? Very good question. In fact, in all high-grade uh, listesis, even in low-grade, we, we tend to do that because if you when you do the dome dome excision, your your cage fits in much better, you know. Otherwise, can the cage might tend to wobble off, or you may not, may not get a good compression because you cut have to excise the dome. Now, how to excise the dome is another is a part of the question. So what you do is that you, you do you have also you have to do a laminectomy complete laminectomy at that level you would do it in any case that, that means you include you remove the facet also and from that from either side of the of, of the uh, dura then then you put your osteotome and un, under image guidance you just knock off the dome parallel so make the S1 flat in this plastic uh, this one uh, is actually dome shaped. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, also. Sir, you were on this. Yeah, I got this this table in between. So does does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you very much. Anything, anything else yes. you were you were looking for? But yes, it's a good yes, idea sir. because number one, it gives it gives you a horizontal surface to to case your, to put your interbody device there. Number one. It also gives you more space. So if there's if there's a, a high grade blastosis, is a dome there. If if you flatten the dome out, you you're basically doing osteotomy actually. See, so you're going to shorten the posterior fragment because you've already done a uh, laminectomy. And if you remove the dome also, 
then you're shorting the posterior column because, and that is the principle of correction of kyphosis. So you'd get a better correction of kyphosis by, by do, uh, excising the dome, right? And also when you remove, when you shorten the posterior part by removing the lamina as well as the dome, then your tension on, on the exiting root is much less. And uh, so has, has Swamajit left or is he still there? No, sir, sir has left. Uh, he was busy. In, in fact, that's what I noticed in one of the x-rays of his, that there, there was a dome which is left behind and, and the cage had, had walked up slightly more anterior. Anteriorly, yeah. You know? So if you cut the dome off, I think that is the... Uh, that is the reason why Aditya uh, put that question in the chat. A good, very good question. Sir, I have another question. Meanwhile, Pankaj sir is getting back. Like uh, Abhishek sir said that we should give a trial of four to six weeks of conservative treatment for uh, lumbar PIVD patients. Mm -hmm. So in that four to six weeks duration, can we go ahead with a root block or should we wait for four to six weeks? Very good question because I had noted that question down for Abhishek myself actually, you know, right? So if Abhishek is there, then I'll, I'll, I'll ask him to answer that. So let, let me more quantify that question for what you're asking. So Abhishek, are you there? Yes. Okay. So let, let's put a, put a scenario. Okay. Uh, a young male, you know, par, uh, you, uh, posterior lateral disc prolapse on MRI, first episode, pain, pain, radicular pain, right? You put him on conservative treatment, right? three weeks of conservative treatment, he still has leg pain. Now, what are you going to do? Would you would you do a root block, number one, or you'll do surgery? So my uh, idea about giving root block is uh, to tide over the natural history of a lumbar disc herniation, actually. So basically, as 90% of people will get better at three months, so I'm, I'm just trying to tide over that period. Actually, all the medications also do the same job, like giving pre-gabbling, anti-inflammatory, physiotherapy and everything. You are just passing time for three months or six weeks so that the natural healing takes over. Whereas uh, the root block will give you an opportunity to reduce the pain while still giving you some time. So I would be very uh, inclined towards giving a root block at three weeks and then waiting for another three to four weeks. If the pain doesn't come back, we have done our job. If the pain comes back, that means there is, uh, you know, some uh, uh, mechanical compression which is causing irritation and that needs to be removed physically by doing surgery. So actually, the effect of root block comes from the chemical hypothesis of a, of a disc herniation. So basically, once the disc comes out, it irritates and creates inflammatory response around the nerve root. And that is the cause of uh, pain in most of the people. Mechanical compression is also an aspect, but that is a minor aspect in the whole problem. So root okay. block acts on that problem of chemical you know, irritation on the nerve roots. That so is why... So fair enough. So, but but in which case you would directly go and do a discectomy, and except of course cauda equina, in which case, which, uh, that is what Naveen was driving, trying to drive at, would you directly go and do a discectomy? If there is a weakness associated with significant amount of leg pain. So my point is, if there is only pain, no weakness, no nothing like that. I would pain is no there. I would give nerve root block. At three weeks, I would give nerve root blocks. In fact, I might be inclined to give it earlier if the pain is not getting better with conservative care, like physio, medication, and other things. And if I, I, is... think, I think that's the right way to approach yeah. Naveen. Give, give yes. the patient a trial. And, and you see that about 40% of the remaining patients would also improve. They may not need the surgery at all. You know? And if, as rightly, uh, if he's rightly said, if there's a if there's a weakness associated and significant weakness, not, not a just an EHL weakness, if he has got a foot drop, for example, significant foot drop and a pain, I would, uh, and conservative not improving the state of his going to discectomy. Tarun, you, you, you raised your hand, yeah. You want to so, come in? Sir, I would like to take this question a little further. In practice, we see a lot of patients who whom we give a root block and they have inadequate response and no response. 
So now I would like to ask Dr. Abhishek, what would be his next step? Would he give a root block for the second time or third time? Because I know people who give root blocks uh, up to three times as well. Or now would he be a candidate for surgery? So for me, I feel that if root block is done properly, if not therapeutic, it will be diagnostic for you. Right? Because if you have a clear-cut L5 radiculopathy, if you are giving local anesthetic around that area, it should take the pain away at least for 6 to 24 hours for that patient. Right? And there are studies which show that if you have done a root block and patient has temporarily improved and the pain has come back, then the chances of success of a discectomy is higher. In fact, it goes up to 95%. If you do it without a root diagnostic root block. So I give uh, the option to the patient that the first injection is diagnostic as well as therapeutic. I don't tend to repeat an injection if the pain comes back in the patient. So I would like to repeat it if say suppose the pain was 100 and after the first injection the pain came down to 70. Patient is now carrying out most of the activities and he wants incremental relief which is not coming from physiotherapy, then the option would be to give another injection to give that, you know, 30% more relief. And if the patient is getting better with that 30% also, then the job is done. If the patient says that it is affecting his activities of daily living and he cannot live like that, then it is a lifestyle enhancing surgery. Then I would offer a discectomy in that case. So my first injection is very critical. I would like to do it properly. That is why I use both AP and lateral C arm when I check my needle. I do a contrast and get a good radiogram, uh, rutogram. Actually, there are three types of rutograms described by, in uh, Raj Shekran and Rishi's paper. So you can go through them, you know, depending on how the dye flows, you can do a prognostication also of how the root block will uh, affect. Also in transitional vertebra, the root block doesn't give a long lasting effect. So you should always tell the patient before you give that it is more of a diagnostic thing rather than might not be a therapeutic effect for long term. Okay. On, on, on root blocks, another question to you, Abhishek, since you do so many of these. Uh, L4-5 posterior lateral disc. You would like to block the, the exiting route or transverse or traversing route or both? Uh, one, the L5. Traversing one. Uh, traversing. Okay. Sir, uh, we have questions on chat. Uh, I'll like Jaiswal sir to please uh, take up the questions. First question is like, does all uh, need interbody fusion in high grade dysplastic or reticulosis? Points to consider. The first question is this one. Sir, please. Does all need interbody fusion in high grade dysplastic, reticulosis? Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, uh, I, I think uh, Dr. Basu touched on this. In a low-grade listesis, you can you can get away with a posterior lateral fusion, right? And 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 pedicular screws. But in a high-grade listesis, I think it's a good idea to do an interbody fusion, almost always, unless if, uh, unless you know if it is a long-standing uh, uh, grade three listesis, for example. And the say in a lady of about say uh, say about forty five years of her age, where you know it's not going to progress, everything is sort of uh, stabilized there. Her main problem is a stenosis, right? In which case you can just do pedicle screws and and do a do a uh, de decompression of the lumbar canal stenosis. But if you're looking at addressing the listing, the instability part of it, if you're addressing the instability part of it, that means you're reducing it. Even if you're doing a partial reduction, I think you have to do an interbody fusion for a better stability. So the next question, sir. Uh, when to stop reduction in high-grade listing, apart from dropping signals, if we are using neural monitoring? Okay, uh, so so what what uh, the procedure which uh, the uh, technique which we follow is that uh, you know you you would uh, it's basically uh, harms technique you you put place a screw in four and you place a screw in five and s one right 
and you you with a reduction device or a reduction screws and you you're trying to lift the l5 towards your towards your rod which is spanning a spanning l4 and s1 right and you do it not at one go you you do it multiple multiple maneuvers right so you do it on one side partially then go on to the opposite side and come back to this line to finally if the screw at some stage of one side starts backing out right then stop they don't go in for further reduction then you, then what you do you just stop there take the one side the rod is already fixed you take out the rod on the opposite side where, where the screw is coming out then you bend over bend the rod so to accommodate uh, uh, the partial reduction right lock that go on to the opposite side and do a try the manipulation again if, if that screw also starts coming in and take the rod out and and start fixing it there but it's very important when you are attempting a reduction to a good release like like any rigid deformity correction that you do is a good release now what release do you do in a high grade listesis is is that you you remove all the facet on either side of the facet you remove the disc totally disc and you do not put in the case there where and you start reducing it first so if you have a case there or or the disc already there then your reduction will not be so smooth and then there there'll be tension also remove the disc and then start you know reducing it and then put the interbody device there yes so i have another question like uh, when we are doing low grade distances also do you bend your rod so you keep it straight and also what are the techniques you use to reduce the distances uh one is positioning when you position the patient in the ga you you, you uh, your your uh, if you if you bend your hips slightly more even if you have in a prone position if you bend your uh, hips slightly more yes. you'll have you'll get almost uh, in in ga especially in in mobile sort of listesis you'll get pl- 0.5 to 1 grade reduction on its own there itself right and i do not keep my rod straight i bend the rods in and and when you when you do the reduction then then uh, you know the thing is that you you try to rock it back and if it is more than 2 degree uh, in grade 2 then we we normally take l4 also and reduce it fully and but you, you if you want to just have a mono segment fixation then you, you can cut the rod out at l4 uh, because you haven't damaged the capsule there so just cut it out use l2 l4 to reduce your thing and then leave it as as l5 as one fixation abhishek you'd like to add sir anything more no sir i think uh... you know i mean you have you have already described it very nicely tarun uh sir uh, just one thing just second question was there there we went to stop reduction in high grade listesis i think uh, we all have experienced such cases and it's also described in literature that in high grade listesis it is a last 20 to 30% of the reduction which is extremely dangerous which puts your l5 nerve root at a, at a in a precarious situation and uh, there are yeah. lots of cases where they may not be in immediate drop in the signals or an immediate neuro deficit but these patients they have a delayed post operative l5 nerve root palsy which occurs at about 40 to 72 hours later so uh, i think in my experience in high grade listesis i uh, uh, if possible and i have achieved a satisfactory reduction i do not uh, uh, over attempt to uh, reduce the last 20% so that my l5 nerve roots are uh, at a little bit less tension Uh, and that that uh, fear of a post operative nerve root palsy is is avoided uh, what is your experience with delayed post operative nerve root deficit sir uh actually delayed you know, we have not had problems with it, with delayed uh, with delayed uh, uh, nerve root palsy problems have been there almost 40% is uh, severe leg pain or hamstring tightness right which over a period of time would go back if you have to have a neurological deficit it occurs on the table and your things uh, you know this thing is show it does show up you know and you're right it it immediately uh, by the time you close it should may not show up but but uh, before you you supine the patient it would you normally show up now the the, the controversy about leaving the last 20% reduction 
intact or not is very very controversial you know you, you can still get a get a palsy on the table itself if uh, it's not just a reduction but it's also a lot of people are saying this that is the lumbar uh, lumbar fascia where, where the nerve nerve root is exiting out with that we get the stretch that can stretch can happen at any time you see so so it's not the last you're right majority of the uh, neurological deficit will happen there but if you uh, uh, if you are sort of monitoring it and uh, i would personally even not stop purposely at at 20 degree less if i have to if i'm reducing it i'll go all the way so another question uh, what are your indications for using reduction screws if say it is a low grade listhesis do you usually use reduction screws or you get it with normal screws no i mean i mean see what happens is if you are using a reduction screw that that is helpful if you are if you are using a span a span rod that means if you are using l4 and s1 then a reduction screw in l5 would help you but if you if you just using a low grade or reduction screw you know then, then what will happen is is your if you are not able to reduce the l l l5 over s1 uh, you you may you may still put the rod in but but in that case the the l5 vertebra will tilt you understand so so what we we try to do is, is hold the the s1 and the sacrum in a vertical position this one screw vertical to the sacrum and then try to reduce your l4 you can use a you, uh, you can use an l5 uh, reduction screw in that way but if you use a, a reduction screw on both l5 as well as s1 then in a in a high, in a low grade listhesis it will tend tend to slip forward do you understand why i am saying yes sir yes sir uh, my what happened navin about uh, pankaj's presentation yes, sir, sir he is trying uh, we are just figuring out just give us 2 3 minutes sure thank you sir ask the audience for any other question they want to know uh, navin hello yes sir sir i'm um, just uh, on call with uh, uh, pankaj sir to sort it out sir navin you can ask him to email you and then you yeah, can yeah. i'm doing that only i'm doing that only sir
I have question to Abhishek sir. Abhishek yes, sir. Yes, I mean. Yeah. Sir, how often do you do this screening MRI for all your patients of this lumbar disc? Because as we stay in these smaller cities, the like finances are an issue. We cannot get uh, this screening MRI for each and every patient of ours. So, well, actually, Naveen, in smaller cities also, people are giving you one uh, sagittal film. Yes, sir. So, and anyway, as a part of routine MRI screening also, in smaller cities also, they have to do one scan, sagittal scan for counting. Yes, sir. They do it as a standard thing. It's just that you have to call them and ask them to give you that film. That they are routinely giving, sir. Yeah, yeah. So, you don't need to have a separate film for that unless you suspect something in that but you can ask call the center and they i i think in it's easier in smaller cities than in big cities yeah, they will be really happy to give you a, you know at least a screenshot or tell you that there's nothing there and 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 they they try to not give that uh, image to you because uh, you know putting it on a film is a bit bit more expensive yeah. so you can ask them to routinely give it on on a phot photographic paper you know so at, le at least one thing that will help you save cost yes sir okay sir okay um I, i'm sorry for the delay i just hope i, I stick to time is my slides uh, visible yeah yeah pankaj go ahead So, let me start with epidemiology. We all know tuberculosis is, is, is common, but extrapulmonary tuberculosis is uh, relatively rare. It's just 3%. And just 10% of those 3% makes a musculoskeletal tuberculosis. Fortunately, for spinal, tuber uh, for spinal surgeons, spine TB is the most common form of musculoskeletal tuberculosis, and it's like 50%. Now, uh, TB affects all age group, we all know. 90% of them are usually seen in... Uh, uh, adult population. Now, symptomatology, coming to symptomatology, the symptoms are usually insidious and disease uh, progression is slow. And that's why uh, that's why it, it doesn't get picked up in time. The duration of symptoms prior to diagnosis could be as low as three months and it can go up to six months. Considered symptoms, again, are less common and that's how it, it goes undetected. It varies between 17 to 54%. Back pain is the most common symptom, uh, nearly seen in 90 to 100% of these patients. Now, next uh, is the neurological involvement. Neurological involvement is, uh, is like uh, approximately 40%, 23 to 76%. Now, other thing which you need to know is the non-contiguous vertebral uh, lesion, which is on rise nowadays. It's nearly 15 to 20% we see. Cold abscess can be seen sometimes while uh, deformity uh, can be present if there is predominant involvement of anticolumn. Deformity would be in form of either knuckle, uh, angular, or round kyphos kyphosis. Now, looking at the neurological deficit, the incidence uh, is uh, somewhere between 20 to 41 percent. And uh, what we commonly call as paraplegia of early onset, which is commonly seen in active disease within two years of treatment, Usually, it is by the pus, granulation tissue, or it could be cases material. Sometimes, pathological subluxation, dislocation can give rise to paraplegia. And rarely, uh, a thrombosis or, uh, and uh, arthritis can give rise to paraplegia. So, we all uh, are groping in dark, especially when the symptoms are, uh, are less and, and if there is no deficit. Next investigation, which you come across is the X-ray, which should be the first investigation. And things you need to look for in an X-ray are a decrease in disk space, destruction of end plates, fuzziness of the margins. You can also come across demineralization of the vertebra. There could be obvious kyphotic deformity. And uh, obviously, you should not uh, miss out on the, on the obvious uh, pre-vertebral shadows. MRI is the investigation of choice, and uh, it can it's more, one of the most in, sensitive investigations for uh, to detect uh, infection in spine. You can look for hypointense signals uh, on T1 and hyperintense on T2 weighted images. You can uh, yeah, look at this MRI. This is a T2 and a T1 uh, SAG where you can see hyperintense signal 
uh, bone marrow signal along with collection, which is T2 hyperintense and T1 hypo. You can also see end plate erosions, sub sublegmentous collections, and and uh, that's how you come to uh, a diagnosis that you are looking for a uh, for a, uh, infected spinal discitis. CT scan not very commonly done, but uh, in case you are planning surgery or you are planning biopsy, this can come handy, and it can also tell you which vertebra you can skip or which part of the vertebra you need to take biopsy from. The other newer investigations which are coming up are uh, are the are the you know the the quantitative MRI or the DTI which is commonly done. We have done some work on DTI and how DTI can can help us. Uh, if not diagnose, at least it can help us prognosticate the uh, the recovery, neurological recovery. Now there are a series of bacteriological investigations which are must uh, when you are looking for a patient of spinal tuberculosis. One is AFB smear. Now the sensitivity of AFB smear could be low, uh, and uh, and and uh, but it's one of the important part of the battery. Histopathology is the gold standard. Sensitivity can go up to 72 to 97 percent. What you need to look for in histopathology is either uh, granulomas, epithelioid cells, or you look for caseous necrosis with granulomas, Langerhans cells, and uh, with peripheral lymphocytic infiltration. So these are something which are consistent with tuberculosis. Just reactive hyperplasia does not uh, talk about, uh, does not say that this is tuberculosis. Now, this histopathology can be done uh, with a fine needle, can be done with a CT guide biopsy, or uh, when you're doing it open uh, while operating the patient. So, uh, all three things are fine. Uh, next important investigation is, is culture and osteoarticular tuberculosis. Uh, traditionally, we had a solid culture, and now we, uh, we are moving on to liquid cultures, uh, which has better turnaround time. We can get early, uh, early results. And uh, with the advent of in, uh, you know, technology, we have MGIT and Bactech, which is really hastening the entire process. So uh, overall, uh, the speed is uh, speed of uh, growth is quicker with Bactech MGIT, uh, while the sensitivity goes down, but specificity goes really high. Now, the thing which the, uh, the National Tuberculosis Elimination Program is talking about is a CBNAT or gene uh, is a gene base. It's a uh, nucleic acid amplification based test, uh, with, which is uh, easily done and it's basically based on uh, real time PCR. It not only diagnoses tuberculosis, but it also tells you about drug resistance. Turnaround time is really fast, it's like two hours in a good lab. Uh, it can identify rifampicin resistance. And uh, and that's how uh, CBNAT is uh, one of the tests which is being recommended by by uh, it has a high sensitivity as well as a, uh, fairly good uh, specificity. Line probe assay is the next uh, line of treatment line line of investigation if you are looking for drug resistance, especially it detects not only rifampicin but isoniazid uh, re resistance. The turnaround time can be one to two days in line probe assay. Now, how uh, now uh, with those battery of investigations, obviously you get um, hemogram, ESR, CRPH, all those kind of investigations, and then you go for these advanced microbiological investigations, and uh, and 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 then once you arrive to diagnosis, then you think about how the treatment should go. The treatment has evolved, uh, and I'll I'll be just skipping this, and uh, I'll be just talking about what the management majorly is. So uh, everyone has to remember that tuberculosis is a medical disease and antitubular treatment is the mainstay of treatment. Surgery is required when indicated during the management, but not every patient needs surgery. What are the components of medical therapy? Obviously, we talked about biopsies and we've been emphasizing on how uh, biopsies and, and, and uh, the evidence of bacteria uh, in, the, in the past makes a lot of difference. Then it is followed by antitubular treatment and uh, palliative medicines and base uh, brace uh, support. So uh, uh, antitubular treatment, as I said, is, is the mainstay of treatment. Now, what drugs are given? You give uh, four ma major drugs. First line drugs are isoniazid, rifampicin, pyrazinamide, ethambutol. It's a combination of bacteriostatic and bactericidal drugs plus minus streptomycin. 
Now, how often do you give it? Uh, nowadays, DOTS is talking about daily regimen and, and DOTS has actually uh, changed the entire scenario of tuberculosis treatment uh, and uh, it, it improves the patient compliance. It's, it's, uh, it has lower failure rates and obviously it comes uh, reasonable uh, with reasonable price for the patients. Now, the controversial thing is uh, the treatment duration is still debatable and uh, still people have not come to a con consensus. I'll just share my experience. What I'd follow in my, in my clinic is uh, two months of intensive, case, intensive phase, which is four drugs, which is followed by continuation phase, which is for 10 months, uh, uh, three drugs. So that is what we do. And 12, at the end of 12 months, we get a contrast MRI done. And, uh, and and we look for uh, any signs of active disease or uh, if there is any healing. Now, PET scan and uh, PET CT has come uh, recently in uh, as, as a newer investigation to tell you whether it's time for you to stop antitubular treatment or not. So all in all, I give antitubular treatment for 12 months and then repeat with a contrast MRI and other blood investigations to see if uh, that uh, antitubular treatment has to be stopped or you continue. The bottom line is that you have to confirm the diagnosis, achieve a bacteriological cure of the lesion, you treat the compression on spinal cord, if any, and uh, and don't allow a spine to get deformed and don't allow it to have a late onset paraplegia. And there comes the role of surgery. Who, who, who all are the right candidates for, uh, for surgery? So first indication is TB spine with neurological deficit. A neurological deficit which has developed during treatment, it's getting worse on treatment, or it's not improving on the on antitubular treatment. So this would be a right ca candidate for surgery. A paraplegia of rapid onset, or if it's a spinal tumor syndrome, or a posterior element involvement, and paraplegia in elderly population. So these are uh, these are some of the indications where you need to, uh, to to immediately think about surgical intervention, or it is a severe paraplegia. Severe paraplegia means, in, if I have to look at Kumar and Thuli, it is grade four paraplegia, and they are also good candidates for uh, surgical decompression. So this is one patient, uh, Prankel B paraplegia, not improving on antitubular treatment, and and then we did a lamina sparing kind of procedure and uh, and and a short segment fixation. Uh, relatively more difficult case, cervical dorsal tuberculosis with the uh, Frankel A paraplegia. So it's, you look at it, it's a junctional area with long segment disease. We did a staged posterior followed by anterior and, and this patient is doing good. Next indication would be a suspected drug resistance. So this lady uh, came to me with neck pain and she was already on ATT for pulmonary tuberculosis. So a lesion in a bone appearing uh, when the patient is already on antitubular treatment could be an indication for uh, for uh, uh, either biopsying it or or, uh, or opening up or uh, doing a surgery. So uh, this is one of the indication for uh, for surgery. Doubtful lesions. So you look at this; it looks like an innocuous kind of a uh, fracture uh, or, or osteoporotic fracture. I'm, 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 uh, I don't have the MR here, but this turned out to be a central tuberculosis. So uh, when the diagnosis is not sure, it's, it's an atypical presentation of spine tuberculosis. That could be one of the indications for uh, surgery. Now I'll uh, just open this entire house uh, I, I, for, to the discussion of neurological uh, TB spine with, without neurological deficits. So we have been talking about deficits, deficits, deficits. But what happens if the patient does not have, it's a paradiscal lesion, and the patient does not have neurological deficit. So look at this patient. She's a she's a young girl, pan vertebral disease, and it's a paradiscal lesion, but she's got pan vertebral involvement. So uh, this is where the com uh, comes the concept of instability in spinal tuberculosis. A patient who has got uh, all the three columns involved, plus uh, she's got bilateral facet involvement. Take take uh, a look at this gentleman who has got a multifocal involvement of cervical dorsal junction. You have kyphosis here, yet the patient does not have a deficit. So, uh, you know, these are some of the tricky cases and, and that's when we came up with this uh, this uh, this uh, scoring system where Professor Jaiswal and, and uh, Dr. Basu also was part of the team. And this basically guides you how uh, a patient without deficit should be offered surgery uh, and should not be allowed to progress uh, to either painful kyphosis or deficits. So they, this has a lot of domains in it and there's a scoring given to each. Uh, a score less than seven is uh, considered as stable spine. Manage them on antitubular treatment and uh, conservative treatment as you wish. Patient with seven to 10 
can potentially uh, progress. But if there is score more than 10, it is uh, unstable spine and there is no role of pure, pure conservative treatment in those patients. Quickly, some examples, uh, eight-year-old girl, you look at this, there is four vertebral involvement, 50 degree of kyphosis. And if you add the score, it becomes 17. So if you leave this child without surgery and only on anti treatment, she'll end up in progressive kyphosis. And, and that's what we, uh, we intervened and we did a short segment fixation and tried to correct her spine. Um, a relatively easy looking uh, kind of a case, a uh, 25 year old female, purely, purely instability pain, vas nine on 10, no deficits whatsoever. So um, x-ray wise, it looked like a D10, D11, but you got a CT and MRI done and it's a, it's a, uh, at least two level disease. And, uh, and uh, if you add up the score, it becomes 12. So again, surgery, and then, and that's how we did. We did a all 360 degree kind of uh, fixation. She's doing fairly good, and it's like more than uh, three years follow-up uh, with us. A uh, young girl uh, with, uh, again, VAS on eight on 10, she was non-ambulatory. There was no deficit. However, she was not able to walk. Look at the spine, how it's opening up posteriorly. And we got an MRI done, and, and you there you see it's it's a posterior, purely posterior kind of a disease with, uh, with the destruction of facets and other posterior elements. Uh, you take up the score, the score is 14. So if you let the let, let this patient again, uh, either you look at the uh, spine in the coronal plane, it's deviated and sagittal plane, there is deformity. So you will allow this patient to either uh, be in bed for long or uh, allow her to go in for progressive deformity and, and de deficits. So uh, then we, we thought of doing a fixation and, and fusion for this patient. Now, if you look at this patient, the index patient, patient, which I was initially talking about. So again, uh, the score was high on this patient for this patient. And we did a staged uh, posterior followed by uh, sternal splitting anterior procedure. And we put a cage anteriorly. So this is how it looks after uh, surgery. And, and this is like recently he came to me with six months follow-up and he's holding well. This patient has other issues. He's got a, he's got a, a what do you call, um, ATT induced hepatitis and there, there's modification of ATT and things like that. So uh, all in all, I want to say that instability is something which you need to look into and you need to uh, address it and, and, and don't allow the patient to land up in deficits. So frankly, we are moving from, uh, you know, middle path to prophylactic surgeries. So this is some uh, kind of a concept which, which has to come across uh, with everyone that there is a role of prophylactic surgery in, in spinal tuberculosis. Now, uh, that was all about active tuberculosis. Now, what about uh, a heel disease? So this patient, uh, so this, this could be one of the examples where the patient was not intervening well in time and this guy had a painful kyphosis of the thoracolumbar spine. And, and this, uh, this could be partly because of the mechanical uh, misalignment. Sometimes these patients can have a, a late onset paraplegia. That would be a really difficult case to manage. Uh, I think Professor Jaswal would vouch uh, for it. And I, I have seen myself and, you know, how sir used to discourage patients with uh, with the with late onset paraplegia. I must, might have burnt my fingers with late onset paraplegias. So they're tricky cases, difficult ones. You can't, uh, you, can't uh, you know, promise them uh, heaven. And that's how it, it is. So better to, uh, to conserve or uh, treat them well in time. Now, this patient uh, obviously needed some kind of osteotomy. This patient was an intact guy. And we did a PSO, pedicle subtraction osteotomy. And he's doing good. You know, these are the corrections which you can achieve with the pedicle subtraction osteotomy in post-tubercular kyphosis. Minimal invasive has, has revolutionized uh, treatment in, in spinal tuberculosis, uh, sorry, in uh, uh, spinal pathologies like glycises and degen kinds. And, and uh, why should tuberculosis be left behind? And you, if you carefully select this case, this is our uh, study, uh, obviously with Professor Jaswal, and, and, we, and, and, and you can pass on the benefits of minimal invasive surgeries to tubercular patient as well. Uh, it's, it's a very good tool, especially if you have a good patient selection, it can give you excellent results. So all in all, I just want to uh, conclude by saying that early detection of, uh, of tuberculosis by a good clinical evaluation uh, is a must. There is battery of investigations. Don't shy away. You know, most of you must be in um, practice, practice where you want to, you know, um, uh, you, you may not be, you may, may be shy of, uh, you know, asking for a lot of investigations. But trust me, most of, uh, most of the literature now talks about not one investigation, but all those investigations, you know, the AB stain, culture, and other things. Medical management go uh, as per the NTP guidelines. Surgery is reserved for severe progressive neurological deficits, instability, 
where the diagnostic dilemma or the patients are not responding. Kyphosis prevention is, uh, you know, by early identification risk factors is crucial. I would thank you for your patient hearing. And, and these are my some of the publications in uh, spinal tuberculosis. So we have done quite a number of work. We've been doing a lot of, you know, uh, as I was talking to you about uh, deficient tensor imaging. And, uh, and uh, now we are working on, uh, on other things like drug resistance pattern and, and, uh, and uh, anterior column reconstruction, things like that. Thank you. I'll be more than happy to take questions now. Thank you, sir, sir, for giving us insight on TB spine. It's a very common problem we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. Thank you, sir. Sir, I'd like to have uh, uh, inputs from Jaiswal, sir, on TB spine, as he has also done lots of work on TB spine. Sir, please. Uh, I think Pankaj has covered entire, the entire uh, spectrum of uh, the cases and very nicely presented case in his, and he at the end said he's doing lots of good work in, on tuberculosis, and his scoring system is now being, being recognized internationally. So that that's that. Uh, Pankaj, just a, just a quick uh, uh, word from you on the relevance, importance of uh, doing a biopsy before starting ATT. Do you do uh, biopsy before starting ATT? In, all tuberculosis cases. That's the burning question. I like your opinion on this. So what I follow here is I subject them to biopsy, but I don't put them on therapeutic vacuum. No, no. All the cases are subjected to biopsy. All the all cases. cases in the all the cases. I, I all the cases I subject them for biopsy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And sir, what all investigations do you send, sir? Do you send histopathology, gene expert, culture, or only gene expert or like that, uh, histopathology. See, uh, if if I have adequate samples, I'll send everything, Naveen. But the most important and which is part of NTEP program is CBNAT. CBNAT is like a screening tool nowadays for tuberculosis. So CBNAT is must. However, there are lacunas in CBNAT, especially if you have a uh, tissue. If you have pus, it's excellent. You get good results. But if you have tissues, there are issues with homogenization and, you know, you can get false uh, reports. So I would say a recent paper we published in the European Spine, we, we spoke about role of HPE and CBNAT. These two should be should be sent. And if, say, everything comes out to be negative, do you start the patient on DTT or what, sir? Uh, come again if uh, the patient is? I'm negative for everything, like gene expert and histopathology is also not conclusive. So do you okay. start the patient on ATT or you go ahead with something else, sir? I would repeat a biopsy. I would like to repeat a biopsy, uh, but the patient would continue. So I, uh, that's what I said. I, I don't leave the patient on therapeutic vacuum. I allow him to carry on with those, uh, those, those medicines, but I would like to repeat the biopsy. What, what about uh, classical uh, picture, MRI picture of a TB spine? Pre-vertebral, paravertebral, paradiscal involvement, abscess, and everything. Gene expect negative. Once in a while, you'll get some patients, right? And and you know, so what what would you do in your histopath? You you get uh, you know all the incrementary thing, including giant cell tumor. No granuloma seen. What do you do? Sir, as I said, obviously, uh, you know, uh, this is like a tricky question. I know we, we, we're going towards, you know, diagnosing on, on clinical radiological. I totally understand that, uh, you know, being an endemic country, most of the cases are tuberculosis, you know, and, and there are radiological findings by which you can, there are subtle radiological ways by which you can make out if this is pyogenic or this is tubercular. Uh, I would give an attempt for biopsy every time uh, I look at a case of a, a paradiscal lesion. However, so having said that, I would start patient on antitubercular treatment. Okay. Another well, question. Coming, coming to your histopath, uh, the criteria which you had mentioned, and Anil Jain has talked about that, you know, uh, you know, you know, which which one would you rely on uh, on most? You know, granuloma is not always seen. Ten percent patients will not show granuloma. How much significance is that? Sir, as I said, if there is reactive hyperplasia, it does not talk about it. Does not say tuberculosis. But if there is a granuloma, caseous material, or or giant cells together, then more or less it's clear. No, no, that no granuloma not there. The other things are there. Now, would you start that or? 
So if okay. Cibinat comes out positive, then I am. I think I'm. I'm rest assured. And Cibinat has excellent sensitivity, as I was talking about, as as high as ninety percent. So um, I think Cibinat is something to rely on, and you can start on ATT. At the turnaround time, as I was talking, is um, though the text mentions about two hours, but you can get it next day or uh, you know within forty eight hours. Even the government setups, uh, they're giving it within forty eight hours. So it's a quick way of detecting tuberculosis. Uh, sir, I have one question. Like, if the patient's uh, radiological picture is very indicative of TB spine, and the patient is not requiring any surgery, so do you subject your such patients for biopsy before starting uh, ATT? Naveen, as I again, I'm trying to emphasize that we I subject them for biopsy, yet I start antitubercular treatment based on the clinical radiological uh, okay. findings. Yeah, I do not put them on therapeutic vac vacuum because most of these battery investigation will take long time. No. So, uh, thank you, sir, for giving us uh, such a nice insight uh, into this TB spine. Uh, sir, uh, I have a question, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sir, as I told you, are uh, giving ATT for a year uh, for uh, like uh, intensive phase and continuation phase, including total twelve months. And after twelve months, you uh, proceed with the uh, contrast and MRI. And if you find uh, like soft sepsis in contrast MRI. Uh, then how will you proceed, sir? And uh, if you proceed with the ultrasound, uh, ultrasound <coughs> guided aspiration, and it shows sterile pus, then uh, what will you do next? If you uh, you will proceed with the uh, ATT lo uh, lo uh, do, uh, longer uh, ATT, or what will you do, sir? Okay, I think that's a very good question, and I think Dr. Jaiswal would agree with us with me that uh, sterile abscess can be left alone. As long as there is no marrow signal changes, as as long as uh, everything has dried up, you know you have fatty infiltration of the marrow, and there's no intraspinal component, uh, intraosseous abscess or uh, abscess in the in the psoas can be just left alone. Yeah, but the but that that is easily said than done. How how did you say that that's a sterile abscess on on an MRI? You know, no sir, uh, on ultrasound uh, guided aspiration. How frequently do you do ultrasound guided aspiration uh, in a in a no, sir. Is it a, do you do do it as, as a routine practice? No, sir. Actually, yeah. there there was a patient, sir. Uh, uh, that's why I'm asking. It's, it's not a routine practice. Let me tell you, what what Pankaj was alluding to is that if you if you do if you see an intraosseous abscess, for example, right. In a patient who received 11, uh, 12 months of ATT, right? Symptomatically, he's fine. Radiologically, there are no symptoms in the sense that there's sclerosis across. But on an MRI, you see a, a couple of intraosseous abscess, which is well encapsulated with sclerosis, you know. And then that, that you tend to label as a query uh, abscess, which is, you know, sterile abscess. Then, then the radiologists, they say that do an interval scan. And you do an interval scan in MRI, say after, after 6 to 12 weeks, and it remains just the same. Then you label it as, uh, as a sterile abscess, which is not sort of, you know, do it. But, but I have not had seen any patient in which we had to, uh, to go and ultrasound guided, you know, you know aspiration of that, that intraosseous lesion. Uh, uh, just one, one, one more uh, question, Naveen. There's, there's a there's a question in the chat, uh, which, which Pankaj is, is addressed to you. Can you take that up? Okay, I can't see the chat box, sir. Uh, well, uh, the, the question okay. is: okay. Question uh, is what it's, from, it's, it's from Vikas, uh, who's from Calcutta, Dr. Basu's uh, fellow. Yeah. Okay. The question question is: What are the signs you see post TB fixation? at three, six, and nine months? And what all investigations you do in follow-up and one, when? Okay. So, uh, Pankaj is yeah. asking post-op post, post 
TB fixation, sure. right? How would you evaluate in three, six, and nine months? What investigations? Okay, so uh, I think uh, uh, three, six months intensive phase. I usually the the again the protocol I follow is I call them every month during intensive phase, whether operated or not operated, and then subsequently again call them every three months. The investigations which I usually ask for is is blood investigations. I would look for um, you know how the ESRCRP is trending and LFT if it is deranging and x-rays that's all i do i get mri done only at 12 months when i'm planning to stop antitubular treatment in the entire process if there if i feel that patient is not improving if there are some major issues with implant and and things like that then i would definitely go in for mri and then look for if this patient is developing a new lesion or things like that yeah so, so it's actually the clinical uh, features the the access to see if there's any sclerosing happening or not implants are in position or not and that the deformity is controlled or not number one number two the the blood parameters the usual esr and crp and and also the uh, uh the pulmonary the, the liver function test and subsequently i totally agree with the uh, with pankaj that you don't need to get an mri done before one year Unless the patient is not improving. Yeah, if the yeah, patient is improving, yeah. x-rays is good enough, yeah. patient is not improving or there's a neurological deficit which has happened, you know. Otherwise, otherwise, as a, as a routine part of a follow-up, you don't need to get an MRI done every three months or six months. Yes, sir. Naveen? Yes, sir. Uh, should we wind up now? It's too yes, late. Uh, firstly, before winding up, I'd like to thank all my teachers under whom I have undergone my fellowship training. Professor Avin Jaiswal, sir, Dr. Samajit Basu, sir, Professor Pankaj Kandwal, sir, Dr. Abhishek Srastav, sir, Dr. Tarun Suri, sir, for taking time out of your busy schedule and giving us insight into basics of spine and all those topics which are uh, like uh, we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. Thank you, sir. Thank, Puneet, you, sir. Thank you for having us over. It was, it was a good experience. I think it was a good learning experience. I hope the people who were on the webinar benefit by that. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Thank night, you sir. very much. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Pankaj, did water come in in your campus? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's not raining anymore, sir. Yeah, yeah. The roads are okay between between Dehradun and uh, Rishikesh. Yeah, 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 everything is fine, sir. Everything is fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Take care, Thanks, sir. Take sir. care. Bye, bye. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Doctor Naveen, how many people have attended the webinar? Yeah, Punit sir, will thank you. Sir, count and I will give you a reply. And in the third TV, I will tell you. Achha. अच्छा नहीं मतलब रफली थोड़ा सा आइडिया लग जाए सर कहां सर मैं कहां ऑफ कर रखी है आपने हां स्क्रीन क्यों ऑफ कर रखी है आपने सो रहे हो क्या हां नवीन रिकॉर्डिंग चल रहा है ओके 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 सर थैंक यू ओके ओके बाय गुड नाइट थैंक यू वेरी मच वंस अगेन टू एवरीबॉडी बाय गुड नाइट हैव अ गुड नाइट